The MacBook Pro's notch is broken, but here's the fix. I'm Mike Cave, David, and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you. And if you want the latest Apple news, leaks, and rumors every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell. So before we come to the MacBook Pro notch stuff, we have got Apple's earnings call later today. And I've adjusted the start time to be 15 minutes before the call, as the numbers tend to drop a little bit earlier than the call itself. So if you want to join me for that, we will be doing normal Q&A stuff as well. It's not going to be just talking about the boring numbers. Uh, there's normally some interesting little tidbits that come out from it. Sometimes. If there aren't, then that's fine. We'll just have a chat about Apple stuff. That's absolutely fine. We enjoy that anyway. Now, moving on, there has been some teardowns of the new MacBook Pros, and the new MacBook Pros have been made a little easier to repair. The batteries now have pull tabs, like the iPhone, for easier replacement when the time comes. Although every time I've tried one of those things in an iPhone, it snapped on me, leaving me with the terrifying prospect of trying to pry the batteries out with the door wide open, ready to throw the whole thing out of the door if, uh, if I pierce the battery cell. Presumably with these larger cells, however, and improving pull strip technology, which I'm sure must have improved over the years, this could be pretty helpful. So good job, Apple. One bonus planet point right there. On this point, however, I would say it's unlikely that any Mac in future, with the possible exception of the Mac Pro, will have any user upgradable parts. And I have to say, I'm fine with that. Upgradability and repair are different things. Having the memory integrated with the CPU and the GPU and the storage is what makes Apple Silicon Macs so incredibly fast. Time will tell, but it also probably makes them more reliable and less prone to any sort of failures. And in general, Apple uses very reliable storage, so I doubt there'll be any issues with those not lasting the full useful life of the computers. I do take issue, though, with Apple restricting display replacements, for example, which seems to be something they're doing now with iPhones. Now, I guess there is potentially security issues with that assembly, including Face ID sensors, but I do feel like it's something that could be overcome. So yes, repairs need to be doable, but Apple leads the industry in terms of supporting their hardware for a really long time with software updates, so it stays out of landfill for longer. Let me know where you think the balance point should be between uh, Apple's repairability, upgradability, and all that kind of stuff, and does giving long software support so these devices can go on to have a life after their first owner make up for it. And it seems like my comments from a few days ago about how everything around the notch would get out of the way automatically was premature. Quinn Nelson, or Snazzy Q on Twitter, has shown how wider items like the iStat menus, which can extend a long way across from the right of the menu bar, actually disappear behind the notch, while menu items from the left leave a gap and pop over to the other side of the camera cutout. And sometimes you can't go behind the notch, and sometimes you can. So yeah, it's a bit of a mess, but it is also still just software which can be addressed by developers or by Apple at the system level. That being said, there is a workaround and you can open the get info window of any app, enable a new option, scale to fit below built in camera, which basically does it the easy way and puts the bezel back at the top of the screen so that everything just fits underneath it. So while this is probably not the most elegant solution to this issue, um, we would love to have all of that screen display available and everything just wrap around it as it's supposed to. At least it works for now. Hopefully in a point update soon, we will get a better solution. And yesterday I asked for a notification squad update. We used to do this on like every video where I would ask you to ring the bell and then you could join the notification squad and get a shout out in the next one. But obviously we get a lot of new subscribers, maybe 50 or 60 a day right now, which I know in terms of big channels is not a lot, but it's still quite a few. And if we had to do it every day and everyone decided to be a part of the squad, it would take forever. So we're gonna do one big update today and let me see if I can get through this in one go without having to cut. I'm not optimistic. So Notification Squad members, we have Lit 8, July 4th, 1776, dedicated to the proposition, Dr. Fonta, Tim Beaton, Megan, Brian Data, The Tech Pastor, Anders Johansson, Laclos Dubery, Michael Rivers, Espresso Mechanic TV, Joshua Gutzeit, Matt Chesterton, Max Irvin, Daryl Wood, Evan Rogers, Cleveland Ironman, Joe Himes, Paul Mark, Mr. Chonkachu, Fred Verdmolder, Naked Bananas, Eugene King, and Slow Cuba. Okay, it took me like three, I had three slip-ups, but that's not bad. 
that's not bad. Uh, let's get into your eye cave answers. If you've got a question you want me to answer in a future show, uh, then let me know down in the comments section with hashtag eye cave answers and you'll get it answered. Mr. Zen asks, eye cave answers, can you explain the difference between pro versus max GPU options in relation to memory bandwidth? The pro has 200 gigabytes memory bandwidth and max 400 gigabytes. I want to run lots of virtual instruments, some piano plugins are 250 gigabyte monsters, and I've been told having the 400 gigabyte memory bandwidth is advantageous in running big virtual instruments, and I have no idea whether I really need it or the Pro would be sufficient. Okay, so this memory bandwidth is per second, so it's 400 gigabytes per second of memory that can be kind of moved in and out. Um, that's a ridiculous amount. I don't think there are any Intels other than some of the very high-end Xeons that have more than 62 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth because they only have dual channel memory. Um, with these, it's ridiculous numbers of extra channels. The M1 original, the non-pro, non-max version, did have, I believe, eight channels of memory. So there you go. Um, I mean, you're not gonna have any problems at all. Um, you don't need uh, that amount of memory bandwidth for virtual instruments. It's about having more uh, available memory in general. So go for the higher memory specs. So if you need to go up to the 64 gigabytes of memory, then you would need to go up to a max chip. If 32 is enough for you, which I would guess it probably will be, as I don't think anyone ran into memory restrictions on the M1 with 16 gigabytes of RAM, um, I think you will be fine. I've seen people running at least 200 virtual instruments with multiple virtual drummers and that kind of thing. No problems on the 16 gig models. But if you can afford it, the extra memory will be handy. Alan B Unboxings and News asks, I gave answers. Do you think Apple could ever announce an M1 Pro and M1 Max iMac Pro, Mac Mini Pro and the Mac Pro? Yep, they're all on the way. Whether they're gonna use exactly the same chips or not, we do not know. There could be dual M1 Maxes in an iMac. There could be quad M1 Maxes in the Mac Pro. Um, the Mac Mini, I'm still pretty sure we're gonna be getting with an M1 Pro and an M1 Max at some point. We just don't know how soon. Apparently there are no more events for this year, which is a little bit sad, but I still think we might get some uh, press release drops maybe for those Mac Minis. Gaylord Fokker asks, IK Vancers, what do you think the M1 Max performance is with games running on parallel and also can one play any Windows game using this service? Enjoying the channel, thanks. So there are gonna be some compatibility issues because the only way that you can really do it through Parallels is to run Windows on ARM's version inside Parallels. So that is something that you need to bear in mind. It's uh, Windows on ARM. So you will only be able to run the stuff that can run on Windows on ARM. Now, I believe they have their own kind of Rosetta type x86 emulation on that side, but then you're going through a couple of emulation layers. Having said that, I've seen some very uh, promising videos on YouTube. Andrew Sai is one of the guys that uh, makes some really good videos on Apple Gaming, and he's only been using the M1 Pro. He's not got as far as the Max, so I think there's uh, there's going to be some real good performance to be had there. Cleveland Iron Man asks, IK Vance's the current Mac Pro can use one and a half terabytes of RAM and given that Apple Silicon uses unified memory, how would it be possible to configure an Apple Silicon Mac Pro to handle one and a half to two terabytes of unified memory? Now, I've got a feeling that this is probably one of the areas that we're not gonna get as much memory because the way that memory is handled by Apple Silicon is different. So there's very few tasks where you would need to load that much stuff into memory. It's very much kind of huge computer models I guess maybe some music production stuff, but again, you're gonna have incredibly fast storage. Everything can be moved in and out of that uh, memory incredibly quickly. And we're probably gonna be looking at memory bandwidth around 1.6 terabytes per second. Once you get to four M1 Max chips uh, running in parallel, so 400 gigabytes per second per SOC, which is just absolutely mental. So as long as you've got the fast storage next to it, so it's gonna be very, very simple to be able to move that uh, storage in and out. Now, it might be that the Mac Pros do get some kind of next level up um, regular RAM that can be upgraded uh, that feeds in and out of the unified memory, but I'm not 100% sure that that's what Apple will do. That would probably be the way that I would expect they might go, but there we go, that's my, uh, that's my thoughts on it. Uh, really not sure how they'll do it, but I'm very excited to see. Andre Eames Photography asks, 
IK Vances, I'm wanting to upgrade to a model that can handle simultaneously live streaming and editing 4K footage in Premiere Pro without getting bogged down. At this point, I'm trying to decide on the best value between the 24 and 32 GPU M1 Max, as well as 32 versus 64 gigabytes of memory. Thoughts on the ideal configuration for this in terms of price and performance. Now, if you want to do it with Premiere Pro, it's not going to be as efficient as using Final Cut. So yesterday I was watching Harris Heller, who is one of the um, streaming kind of highest level of streaming guys uh, online for streaming gaming, uh, runs Alpha Gaming Channel, which is huge. Uh, he's just come over from Twitch over to YouTube, but he has just received the M1 Max. He filmed himself some 120 frames per second, 10 bit, uh, highly compressed video. He was dropping it straight into Final Cut, adding seven to eight adjustment layers, color filters, um, transformations, water droplet effects. Then he had nine instances of 3D text all appearing at the same time, all playing back before it had even rendered, plus adding and removing noise filters. Um, so, and it was absolutely flying through this stuff. So I think uh, you will probably want to go for the highest configuration if you want to be able to edit in real time and stream it. Um, but yeah, he was able to do all of this basically without dropping a frame it was pretty impressive. He was losing his mind. New Quest asks, IK Vances, I tried to install Monterey on the day it released, but it gave me an error when my laptop tried to restart. I tried installing in safe mode, but still have the same message. I have an early 2015 13-inch MacBook Pro, and it's on the Apple supported list. I tried multiple times without success. A Google search shows that others have had the same issue. I finally decided to wait a few days, delete the previous download, and re-download. So glad I have a fast fiber optic connection. Just tried installing and still no luck. No huge deal since I'll be getting my 14-inch MacBook Pro M1 Max on November the 3rd, but I was curious if any of you viewers are having a similar problems. Now, I don't know. It's not something that I'd heard about um, on the older laptops. There might be some issues. I, I It's not something I'd heard about, but I will open it up to the floor. If anyone's had any problems, let us know down in the comments section. Uh, but also, Apple support should be able to help you out with this one, no problems at all, because it's still a supported um, device. Uh, they should be able to help you out over the phone or on live chat, help you get through it. So uh, give them a shout. Peter Hartman asks, I gave answers. I'm wondering about the external monitor situation. None of the myriad reviews I've watched so far even mention it, and I don't know why. Does the M1 Pro run to external monitors from one USB-C port, from two USB-C ports, or from a USB-C port plus an HDMI port like the Mac Mini? And while we're at it, does the M1 Max need a mess of USB-C cables for the four external monitors it supports? Or do you think, unlike the M1 Mac Mini, monitors could be connected to a hub and connected to one USB-C port? I was hoping the new chips would solve my multi-monitor setup problems as I've had to buy two M1 Mac Minis to get three monitor, one TV setup, greatly desired. Recent subscriber, thanks for the great bits. Now, as I understand it, the reason that you can't put multiple monitors through a single uh, port on this is because it's supporting up to 6k displays now I think you could probably just about get two 4ks uh, out of it through a, a, a hub if that hub was able to support that level of stuff but uh, it just depends on which monitors you're using because each port has only got so much bandwidth that's the issue and if you're running uh, high, res uh, high resolution or high refresh rate displays then you probably won't have enough bandwidth on a single port that's not an uh, Apple issue, that's a bandwidth for Thunderbolt issue. So that kind of comes down to Intel, sadly. Um, but uh, as far as I'm aware, you will be able to run one display from each of those ports, but you should be able to pass it through a hub in order to get the other ports kind of branched off of it if you need to add hard drives, all that sort of stuff. Hopefully that sort of answers your question. Um, with, the, uh, with the Pro, I think you can have three... 6k displays so one on each of the thunderbolt ports plus a 4k tv running off the hdmi port that's my understanding of it and randomness r asks ik answers any news on a 50 to 60 mil watch i know ross young mentioned three sizes coming next year and i just got a series 7 wondering if i should return it if there's a bigger size coming next year the series 7 was my first watch and i love the bigger display but if i can e get an even bigger one i'd rather have it over this one what do you think Okay, I would be very, very, very surprised if they go over 50 millimeters. I think probably 47, 48 might be as big as they would go. But who knows? Um, I don't quite see why they would be having a larger one, 
My thoughts when I heard that there was going to be three sizes is that they might actually go to a smaller size again. Because I know a lot of people loved the 38mm when it first came out, and now that has gone up to a 41mm, which is getting quite large again. So I'm wondering if they might reintroduce a 38mm. However, Ross Young, or Ross Displayman as I call him, has said, what would you think of a larger display on an Apple Watch next year? So it seems like they might be going down the bigger path, but who knows? Um, honestly, I wouldn't return it. I would hold on to it, look after it, and sell it on um, as and when we know what's going on. Never kind of buy and sell based on what might be coming. Uh, buy the best that you can get right now, and then if you need to upgrade down the line, resell, recoup a lot of your investment, and uh, and upgrade then. Don't forget we've got the live coming up tonight and tomorrow at uh, 5 p.m. UTC, which is uh, 6 p.m. UK time, I will be premiering our new office setup tour. So you can actually see everything that's here, the new desk from FlexiSpot and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, make some room in your diary for that. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.